So glad to have you all here. Very happy to see that my parents figured out how to get on the Zoom. <laughs> Welcome, welcome. Thanks to everyone who's extremely prompt. Welcome everyone, everyone who's trickling in, welcome. We're gonna get started in about a minute or so. Okay, I think we're gonna get started. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight uh, for this conversation about the past, present, and future of binationalism in Israel-Palestine. Uh, first, I really wanna thank Jewish Currents for hosting us and for being such an inspiring and growing space for debates like this that are too often kept out of the mainstream of the Jewish community. And I also want to thank the Foundation for Middle East Peace and Extend for co-hosting this. I'm Simone Zimmerman. I'm the director of B'Tselem USA. And before we jump in, I wanted to share with you a couple of my assumptions uh, going into this conversation. So the first assumption that I have is that you have all read Peter's piece or are at least familiar with his argument that liberal Zionists should move beyond the two-state paradigm and, invas and embrace a vision of one binational state based on principles of equality. If you haven't, you should check it out after this webinar. The second assumption that I have is that we are not here tonight to debate reality. The reality on the ground is currently one of full Israeli control over the entire area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea and over all 14 million people living in it. This is a reality of one inherently undemocratic state where Jews are guaranteed political, civil, and human rights, while millions of Palestinians are denied them. That reality is fundamentally unjust and needs to change, and I'm very grateful that we don't have to debate that reality here tonight. The one other piece of framing I wanted to give before we jump in is the simple observation that the old one state versus two state debate has run its course and has often even been a tool of maintaining the status quo. We saw this happen earlier this summer, as much of the mainstream in the American Jewish community and in Congress spent weeks in hysteria over whether or not the Israeli government would formally annex the West Bank, even though the Israeli government is already carrying out the process of de facto annexation on the ground every day. Facing this reality means facing the fact that many of the paradigms we are operating within are stale and unhelpful. 
And the purpose of today's conversation is to help us do that and to enrich our understanding of where we might be going. One of the things that I appreciate about Peter's work over the last decade is his wisdom and savvy in seeing where the Jewish community needs to be pushed at just the right moment. And I think this is one of those moments. Now that formal annexation is delayed for now, many in the Jewish community and in Congress and in American politics more broadly have been breathing a sigh, an undeserved sigh of relief. Um, so I'm really grateful to Peter for being one of many people who have helped push this conversation forward. Uh, and I'm really, really excited to have Lana and Shaul joining us tonight to push it even further and to share maybe where he's gone wrong and to get into it all together. Uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce our panelists for tonight. Peter Beinart is a professor of journalism and political scientist at the City University of New York, an editor at large at, at Jewish Currents, an Atlantic and CNN contributor, and a fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Lana Tatur is an assistant professor in development at the School of Social Sciences, University of New South Wales. She was the 2019-2020 IAL postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Palestine Studies at Columbia University and is currently work working on her book manuscript. Shaul Magid is a professor of Jewish studies at Dartmouth College and the Kogod Senior Research Fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. He is a contributing editor at Tablet Magazine and editor of Jewish Thought and Culture at Tikkun Magazine. His forthcoming book, Mayor Kahana, an American Jewish Radical, will appear next spring with Princeton University Press. So um, I'm going to ask our panelists some questions for the next 30 minutes or so. And then we were, will open it up to questions uh, which you can submit via the Q&A function. Uh, and if you have any technical problems, you can drop them into the chat uh, for Jacob at Jewish Currents to help you out with. I will not be looking at the chat function. Okay, so with that, um, I was actually hoping to start with Lana tonight. Uh, you wrote a, a critique of Peter's piece in Middle East Eye where you talk about how Peter failed to identify the legacy of the Nakba in 1948 and Zionism itself as the root of the problem and argued for a framework of decolonization, not just equality as a path forward. So I was hoping that we could start off the night with having you expand on that critique for us and specifically to talk about what decolonization means for you and how you see that as different from the call for equality. Hi everyone and thank you for having me and thank you for um, all the people attending. Um, it's wonderful being part of this conversation. Um, yes, so as uh, many involved um, in you know, research and activism and care about Israel-Palestine once Peter's piece uh, was out, um, I also went and I read the two pieces uh, that were written. Um, the interventions that he makes, especially in relation to what is happening in the Jewish community is something that I also have been following. Um, but reading those pieces, um, we, as you mentioned at the beginning, we agree on the fun fundamentals um, of the reality that exists on the ground. Um, where the disagreement is mainly on is how do we move forward and what kind of a vision or what kind of politics and political project are to be advancing the pro project of um, equitable one state in, in Palestine. Um, for Peter, it was about, it's, it is about reforming Zionism. It is about, about the failure of the Oslo Accords. Um, and it is about rectifying um, reality of inequality. Um, for me, it is a question of decolonization and of um, Zionism as the root cause of the condition that we are currently in. Um, so in this sense, what I see is there is a significant difference between equality and between decolonization. Um, I'm not against equality. Equality is noble. Uh, equality is something that rightly so scares the Israeli state. But 
equality alone or agenda of liberal equality alone is not enough. Um, and it cannot be uh, sufficient without a project of decolonization. And decolonization is important because it forces us to deal with the question of the root causes of that particular condition, which is Zionism, it's settler colonization, and it's the racial politics that is inherent to the project, the Israeli project and the Zionist ideology. And also, it is about thinking how do we not just move towards political equality in the sense of voting rights, but also, how do we dismantle the institutions, the systems, the logics that are inherently colonial and racial? And this is where liberal politics of equality fails, and it continues to fail us. And not only Palestinians, also if we look at you know, what is happening in the world, there is a reason why decolonization is getting that kind of moral currency that Peter seems to think that equality has that Peter, that um, moral currency more than um, decolonization, and I tend to disagree. I think we, I think decolonization has a very strong uh, moral currency, even if it speaks less to liberal crowds. And maybe just in, as as kind of a last note, because I don't want to take um, too much of the time. Um, so maybe two last notes. So. It, there is a constant invocation of the South African model in Peter's pieces. Um, and I think if, if, if the South African models tells us something is that it wasn't about reforming apartheid, it was about abolishing apartheid. Um, and this is something really significant. And also it tells us what it shows us, especially today, is that voting rights and citizenship were crucial, but they are not enough. There is a profound need of decolonization. The second point is we have an example in Palestine of what happens when you only focus on liberal equality. And that is the example of Palestinian citizens of Israel, right? Of 48 Palestinians. And what this experience shows for over 70 years they have been in different forms mobilizing that liberal citizenship discourse, whether in its classic form or in the form of multicultural and multi multinational recognition model. And that project has failed. And part of the reasons that that project has failed, I'm putting the geopolitical reasons aside now and the Israeli state, but as a political project of Palestinians, it is because, again, it, in many ways, it failed to pinpoint the structural issues around Israel. It's not necessarily about equitable citizenship. It is about tackling Zionism and settler colonialism and racial and racist politics. And if we don't deal with the core causes, we, are, we have a model of what exists. We will be left with the situation of Palestinians in Israel, and I think despite the demographic difference of a one state, but we can talk about that um, later on. Uh, thank you, Lana. Uh, so Shaul, I wanna invite you to jump in here. Um, you have also written about the dangers of clinging to a two-state paradigm that no longer exists. Um, and of letting the right kind of define the parameters of this conversation. So I'd love to invite you to jump in here. Feel free to also respond to what anything Lana just brought up. Yeah, thanks a lot. So I am, um, I do have a couple of things I wanted to respond to Lana because I think again, st I think structurally we're actually quite similar. I think we just come from a different place. Uh, in terms of Peter's work and especially the essay um, and a number of other essays, um, that have come out. Um, Yoav Schachter, for example, had a great essay in the Los Angeles Review of Books that worked in similar directions. I think there are two issues worth raising. One is um, what kind of state Israel is now and what kind of state Israel aspires to be. And I think the second question, I think, has to be seriously raised vis-a-vis -vis the last three elections and what seems to have come out of the Israeli electorate. And the second thing, which is really a, a different issue, and I think this speaks a lot to the, the strange 
space that Peter occupies in the American Jewish collective psyche of sorts, that um, he really, you know, what the piece did was really in a way um, talked about the crisis of liberal Zionism. And I think that may be the most, in a certain salient point for American Jews is that liberal Zionism is in crisis because it has invested everything in the two state solution. And therefore, if you're going to take Peter's options seriously, and if that the two state solution is not a reality and I and Lustig and others, I mean, in a certain sense, the idea that the two state solution is no longer possible is not, is not the you know, invention of Peter Beinart, right? It's something that people have been talking about for a long time. Meron Benvenisti back in 1983 with the famous five minutes to midnight speech that there'll soon be 100,000 settlers and without the two states is not viable. So that's not what's new. What's new and I think constructive about what Peter has done is has put the liberal Zionist two-state solution on the defensive. And for the first time, it actually has to defend its position, not only in terms of what is the best solution, but what is a possible reality within Israel-Palestine at this point. And I think one of the things, and maybe I'm taking a little bit of issue with Peter here, is that I think we get tripped up when we talk in terms of solution-based analysis. I think the reality is there is no short-term solution to the conflict in Israel-Palestine. It simply does not exist. We can talk about long-term solutions, but in terms of the short-term, it does not exist. And I think that taking the solution off the table and then dealing with the reality that it's not Peter Beinart who is the one stater, it's the Israeli electorate who are the one staters. I mean, they have consistently voted for political parties who are opposed to a two state solution. So then the question is what kind of state it's going to be. And I think that is the, that is the, ga the gauntlet that Peter uh, throws down. And he received pushback because in a sense, the liberal Zionist community simply has no way, has no apparatus to think about Israel anything other than two states. So I, I you know, I, I, can, I commend him for the essay. I think it was an incredibly courageous essay. I think it was a well-written essay. I think, you know, in, in terms of the notion of decolonization and equality, I think ultimately we're moving from the issue being one of political autonomy in a two-state model to the issue of civil rights in a one-state model. And the question is, how do we get to the one, how do we get to the civil rights debate? Because that's gonna be a long and a very, very robust debate. So I wanna throw something out here. Um, and, and I think probably Lana will disagree because it really is in a certain way, the opposite of decolonization, but it reaches a similar end that, and I wanna ask Peter this too, from the perspective of one state, those that are acknowledging the reality of one state, there is an argument to be made that Israel should annex the entire West Bank immediately. Just annex the whole thing then you can begin to have the real conversation about civil rights. As long as occupation is not annexation, and I agree with you, Simone, it's de facto, but as long as it's not official annexation, you always have that specter of the two states that's gonna keep us from talking about the real issue. And the real issue is not only equality, Lana. I mean, I agree with you, equality has all kinds of, it really is a civil rights issue. So in a way, let's be done with this whole kind of play of yes, two states, no two states, what kind of two states, and say, okay, there's one state from the river to the sea, it's called Israel, what kind of state is it going to be? Great. So before we start jumping into all these other things, uh, Peter, I want to bring you in here. And I'd love to just um, back up for a little second and ask you what it's been like since writing this piece. Um, why do you think this conversation has struck such a chord right now? And um, yeah, were the, were the reactions that you're getting right now what you anticipated? Um, they were fairly similar to what I anticipated, I, I think, because I, I think, you know, like you and others, I, I have a sense of how the Jewish conversation tends to play itself out in particular and how it 
And it obviously has a big impact on the kind of the conversation in elite publications. That is, in some ways, generally a Jewish conversation just playing out in those elite publications. Um, I would say that um, it's um, it's I, it's not that um, it's not so much that it's been intellectually so difficult um, in the sense that I feel, in a way, that the people who are angriest at me were not good faith supporters of the two-state solution to begin with. Um, um, and so their anger that I am abandoning the idea of two states, given that I actually felt, feel like in reality, they're very comfortable with one uh, state where millions of Palestinians lack basic rights, isn't that compelling to me? I would say that, you know, for me, the challenge in this whole thing is to find a way of, of kind of balancing in a way that I can live with um, a moral universalism that, that allows me to take seriously human rights of everyone uh, in Israel-Palestine, and also my particular commitments as a member of the Jewish people, and, and, and in particular as someone who wants to live, needs to live in a Jewish community. I can't live outside a Jewish community. Um, I just wouldn't be happy. It wouldn't be a life I'd want to live. Um, and so for me, the challenge is trying to have, try, in some ways it's more emotional than intellectual. It's, it's just trying to find that balance. And, and um, I would say, you know, there is a way in which reading, for me, reading Palestinian writing on this conflict, um, I read a, a lot for this piece and I've actually just spent really, it's mostly what I've been doing even since this piece came out, is a little bit like, to use a straight, maybe a, is a little bit like falling in love with a, a woman who's not your wife or not the mother of your children. It is, it is both, I, I'm both very, very taken by a lot of the reading that I have done. And yet it's also, um, it's also a cha very challenging because um, I, you know, I mean, I don't need to tell you or Shoal or probably even Lana, this is, um, you know, it, there, we, we um, you know, you the, you step with it's it's somewhat perilous um, to move outside of some of these narratives, um, um, uh, particularly when you know you're you're trying to live inside a certain space. So I don't know. I guess that's not entirely coherent, but that's been a little bit uh, what it's like. I would say that um, for me, what's been liberating about writing the piece, and I'll I'll stop here, is not that I feel like I have all the answers by by any means. It's just that in sense by by asking a different set of questions or being willing to look beyond a, a certain set of answers that I had for a long time, I just feel that it's become a more intellectually engaging question for me than it was before. That there are a lot of new questions that for me are really challenging and morally very compelling. And I will say that, um, you know, one of the things that has been the most moving for me, frankly, um, over the last few months has been reading Palestinian writing that speaks to Jews about the place of Jews um, in a future uh, equal, perhaps decolonized environment. And I, and I feel that, um, you know, we can obviously, we'll talk more about what this phrase decolonization means, what equality means, whether they're opposites or whether they are, they can, they can, be, they can be allies to one another. But I, I, I think that to, to me is, has been part of what's been very powerful to me is, is again and again encountering Palestinian writers who write not only with moral ferocity, but with moral, with, with genuine generosity uh, in their vision of a, of, a, of a society and a state in which Jews are welcome and integral participants. Lana, I wanted to ask you to jump in here. You and a lot of other people have, you know, commented on the fact that uh, Peter's arguments, he just referenced some of them just now, but just the fact that uh, Peter making some of these arguments that Palestinians have made for a long time are received differently um, because of who he is. And I just would love to ask you if there's anything you want to say about that. I mean, a lot of Palestinian um, scholars and activists have pointed it out when uh, Peter's piece came out and it was such a, you know, it was such a watershed moment, right? And everyone was talking about the piece. I was receiving the piece from Palestinians and, you know, seeing it all over social media and, you know, this kind of generative discussion. And Palestinian intellectuals couldn't help but thinking, wait, 
we have been saying these things in different, you know, some of the analysis is the same, some of the analysis is different, and we can talk about it. I think what Peter said now is really important about the Palestinian writing and, you know, what was there. But we've been saying one state, we've been talking about equality, we've been talking about an inclusive polity for decades. And we haven't been listened to. And our voices are not as legible as the attention that Peter's piece is getting, right? And I think, I mean, look at, you know, it's good that, you know, there is an attention to this topic. But then again, there's all these symposium, one of them I'm participating in right now, uh, on the question of the one state. And, you know, we're talking about it as, you know, something that is pioneering intervention in a way, right? That deserves to have all these kind of symposia. While these things have been said, I think what is different and why Peter's piece struck a chord Obviously, it's the racial politics that renders Palestinian voices, you know, unintelligible. But I think there is also another thing. Jewish voices, the Jewish Voice for Peace and other uh, Jewish intellectuals and, you know, activists and writers have been talking about the one state as well. And their work didn't receive uh, the currency that Peter's work uh, did and Cole did. It's partly you know, his public, um, his public position, but there's also something really specific. It comes from within the belly of Zionism, of liberal Zionism. So it is taken differently. And I think what that tells us is the still the strong currency that Zionism and liberal Zionism has. And I think this is the timing was, was right with the annexation, but around the annexation, there were a lot of pieces talking about the one state. It is the writing from the, you know, the heart of the beast, as I would put it, from, from within Zionism that made this piece something that many could not um, simply throw away uh, that easily. They have done with recent calls, either by Palestinians or other kind of Jewish uh, calls previously. Great, thank you. Um, Shoal, I wanna to turn to you and I wanna do a little bit more of going back into some history for a second. So I wanted to ask you, um, do you think it's relevant or possible to be reclaiming pre-state Zionist thinkers for the conversations that we're having right now? That's a great question. And I think it's where um, perhaps Peter and I differ a little bit. I'm not really sure. I know that Peter is still very committed to being a Zionist or, 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 or constructing his notion of one state as a Zionist. I'm not completely sure how useful that is. Now, it is true that there were Zionists pre-state in Brit Shalom or Yehud who were in favor of, 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 a, of a binational state um, or a federation of states. It was a very small group of people. It never really um, attained a, a much attention except for the personalities like Gershom Shalom or like, I'm not Gershom Shalom, really Martin Buber and Judah Magnus, you know, as, as figures. I guess that may be an interesting, an interesting point. I don't know whether uh, I think Zionism made a choice at a certain point, and that choice was it was going to create an ethno state. And that was a choice where there were many battles fought, but that was ultimately the choice that came out. And that I think is what Zionism is today, is the existence of an ethno national state. Now, what the people who are not part of that ethnic group how they will be treated is, is another matter. And they can be treated in a more humanistic way. They can be treated in a less humanistic way. But I think that Zionism is built on the foundations of Jewish exceptionalism. And we can't take the Holocaust out of the picture here because again, most of those pre-state binationalists were, were, were living and writing before the Holocaust. I mean, Martin Buber, of course, continued after. He dies in 1965. And to think about 
the Jewish exceptionalism as rooted in the trauma of the Holocaust, which is why Hannah Arendt was so um, against the immediate creation of a state, because she felt that the Jews needed time to be able to settle after experiencing that genocide. I think that in a way, it, the Holocaust still hovers over the entire collective Jewish psyche, which sees itself as exceptional in this regard that they need or the Jews need an ethno-national state as a, as a place of refuge. Now, binational state can also be a place of refuge. And this is the distinction between homeland and state that Hannah Arendt and other people made. So I'm not really sure whether Zionism is that useful anymore as a term to think about what the future of Israel-Palestine will be. Because as, as long as you are attaching, you're attached to that term, you're, you can talk about paths not taken, but ultimately the choice of an ethno-national state is at the very spine of the Zionist project, be it liberal or reactionary, be it right-wing or left-wing. And I, I don't think that we can get to where we need to go in terms of the civil rights question, as long as Zionism as a term, both in terms of what it means for the Jews and also what it means for the Palestinians, I'm not sure that it isn't more of an impediment rather than something that can actually move things forward. Peter, what do you think of that? So I guess I'd say a couple things. I mean, I think that, um, of course, Shaul is right that the, that, um, the debate between um, Zionists who wanted an ethno state and Zionists who believed in binationalism was a rout. Um, um, but I think it is in very valuable um, to look at minority voices um, for uh, in, in different moments for for, for as ways of opening up alternatives. And I mean, I think what's interesting about the way the debate has evolved is that although the leading figures advocating binationalism in the 1940s were this small group of Jewish intellectuals, it's really Palestinian intellectuals who have picked up the mantle of binationalism in more recent decades. I mean, the, the PLO was arguing for, for, for one secular democratic state, but it wasn't arguing for a binational state. I think one of the things as, as I read Palestinian writing, and Lana can tell me if she thinks I'm getting this wrong, is that in more recent decades, there's been more of a reckoning with thinking about the character of that, that one equal state in terms of one that actually, that where, that recognizes that it's binational character, again, in, in, in Edward Said's writing and in, 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 in other people's writing more, more recently. And so I think in that way, there, the, 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 the argument of some of those Zion, binationalists who consider themselves Zionists has actually become, has remained important. Now, I, I don't, I would of course not expect that Zionism would be kind of anything but radioactive uh, for, for Palestinians. But um, for me, the, 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 its, its value in addition, again, to hearkening back to an intellectual lineage um, that I think has a lot to teach us. Um, and that again, in a certain kind of way actually is now better understood, I think, by Palestinians than by many Jews, is that it's all, talking about Zionism is also, again, particularly in the, talking about cultural Zionism, right? The tradition of Zionism that did not, was not wedded to the idea of an ethno state is a way of talking about the importance of a vibrant Jewish society in Israel, Palestine. Um, and one of the things that um, uh, was, I felt was important for me in this essay and remains important for me is to make a claim that equality, um, and for that matter, decolonization uh, need not mean the end of a flourishing, vibrant Jewish society in Israel, Palestine that can accomplish the kinds of things that Achad Ka'am wanted to accomplish, a kind of cultural production. I'm not a diasporaist. I, d I don't believe that it's irrelevant whether you have a significant thriving large, you know, large Jewish community in Israel, Palestine. I think it does matter. I want that to endure. And part of the purpose of my essay was to argue that um, that, that is possible within a framework of equality. I think it's possible within a framework of decolonization for that matter too. I mean, and I will just say obviously there were obviously there were Jews in uh, 
in, in, in Palestine before the Zionist movement. They were mostly non-Zionists. I entirely recognize that. But I think there's something fundamentally different between the kind, the kind of Jewish, the kind of, the kind of, the, the, I, that, was a, that was not the kind of Jewish society in terms of its numbers and its ability to recreate Hebrew a, as a living language and other things that was, create, that was, that was created. And then I think it has, has value, but needs to be stripped away from its privilege over Palestinians. Anna, I want to ask you to respond to that. And I'm curious, um, you know, what you think of Peter, the, the argument that either Shaul or Peter just made. And um, maybe just to add on that, like, uh, do you see the idea of decolonization as compatible with the label or the framework of Zionism in any way? Um, and what does that mean in a historical context or today? I think the fact that we are actually asking this question is problematic. Um, and it's not about the Palestinian perspective versus uh, Jewish or Zionist perspective. It is a matter of how do we deal with, with toxic projects that are inherently problematic. So the question is itself is problematic because it's asking us to come and accept that maybe we can reform, you know, it's like asking, can you reform apartheid? Can you reform uh, white supremacy? Can you work from within this framework? Um, and, and the core is really, the core of the project is really problematic and decolonization essentially requires us to be anti-Zionists in my view. Now, there is an, another issue that is very significant when we, talk about, um, when we talk about Zionism. And I think it is important to sustain the distinction between, and remember that Palestine was a home to, you know, to the Jews who lived there. Um, and as much as I, you know, the project of reviving Hebrew language and bringing Jews together from all over the world uh, may seem important to Peter. Uh, that project was the destruction of my people, was the destruction of our lives, was the destruction of our communities, was, you know, it, it's, it was a project that we still live its consequences. People are still in refugee camps. The vast majority of Palestinians are living outside of Palestine. And those who are living in historic Palestine suffer discrimination, occupation, ongoing colonization. We cannot be part of a conversation that is talking about reviving um, a progressive, you know, a progressive aspect of Zionism. What we need is though, is a different political language. And what I do agree with Shul is, why insist on Zion, if, if the project is a humanist project, why insist, insist on Zionism? Why not find, and it's difficult, but why not find a new political language to speak about what we are trying to do, to have the conversation outside of that framework? And this is what I find really problematic with, with Peter's approach is that if we, if the one state solution is something that will still have to accommodate some kind of a form of Zionism, then that is not going to ensure equality. That is not going to ensure that history is accounted for properly. So I think the whole, you know, the whole question about Zionism and reforming Zionism is problematic, regardless of the intellectual diversity that Zionism had. It was still a project of replacement. It was still a project that ended up doing horrible, horrible, with horrible consequences for the Palestinian people. So if we want to move forward towards a one state, towards thinking of how do we live in this space? How do we move forward? We have to 
Zionism cannot be part of the equation. We need, I think you need to think whether there is a different political language that and political project that can frame some of the questions that you want to address. But I don't think it can be Zionism. And I don't think it can be something that is similar to Zionism. Um, Lana, I'm going to stick with you for one more minute. So uh, you are sort of offering in response to that, that decolonization is the framework that we should be looking to considering. Um, we're getting a lot of questions in the chat from people who want to know more about what that means. Um, so can you actually like, can you help us to, in a little bit more concrete terms, like give me some examples of what that actually looks like. You know, people want, uh, I've, been, I've been reading the Q and A's um, throughout uh, and people kind of, what do you mean by the decolonization? How does it look like? Um, and going back to what Jules said, it's really difficult to talk about solutions, right? Talking about processes. Um, and the idea of giving a solution is, is, I don't have a clear vision of what decolonization is. I don't know what a decolonized Palestine would look like. I know that I wanna work with others to understand how it could look like. But one thing is clear. We need to think, we can't only think about equality. What are we going to do with property? What are we going to do with the question of land? This is where the idea of civil rights fails. The idea of, let's add, you know, Shaul said, let's, let's, let's have Israel annex the, the territory because it's already controlling the, the territory effectively, right? And then we can talk about civil rights, but this is where civil rights fails. It fails at the, at the fundamentals of the questions, questions of land, questions of return. Um, how do we involve people imagining? What kind of return are we imagining um, for Palestinians? Uh, what Palestinians are imagining their return to be. Um, these are questions that are fundamental. It's not just about voting rights. It's not about just, um, just political rights in the narrow sense of the word. It is about the creation of re-ownership also in the most material and effective ways that needs to be taken seriously. So decolonization really need to think about I mean, we can't just, can we just transport the institutions of the Israeli state? Are we going to transport the land administration? What are we, I mean, are we going to have a one state already built on the Israeli supreme system, on the Israeli land regime that is, it has been applying in the West Bank and in 48 Palestine? For me, clearly the answer is no. I mean, that would be counter to decolonization. And this is what, what I mean by, we need to think what we are saying when we are talking about equality or civil rights and what kind of questions and concerns it leaves out of this, of, of the equation. Uh, we cannot just import these structures. Otherwise, what we will have is voting rights with, sustain, with a system that is, is designed to advance colonization and racial uh, privilege um, for Jewish citizens and the Jewish people more generally. So I don't have a clear solution, but I do think there are fundamental questions we need to ask when it comes to, to decolonization. And if it's about one state, that leaves these systems in place, then we have done small progress, but it's certainly not enough. Uh, Peter, do you want to respond to any of that? And then show I'll bring you back in. Sure. I mean, I think, again, I think part of the difference we have here is just about, um, I think, Lana and Shaul are, 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 you know, are taking a definition of Zionism as the Zionism that ultimately was 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 dominant and successful and, and and created this state and I'm arguing for a minority strain and I'm again and I think I'm I'm you know I think that in a binational state if this is a state if this is actually to be a binational state 
there will be there will be a conversation among Jews about how to maintain that communal autonomy. It can't be a communal autonomy that comes at Palestinian expense, but it will be, I would imagine, Hebrew language schools, um, a, a, a public com commemorations of Jewish holidays. This will be, you know, these are this is what we ha see in other binational states. And so that um, that communal autonomy, that ability to also to maintain uh, this space as a space where. Jews feel that they are, that their community, their their people, their nation can still express itself culturally and communally. I think will be absolutely essential, and I make I think it's I think that's I, that's very important to me. And so again, I think some of those people, like myself, will find cultural Zionism a valuable tradition in thinking about what in thinking about the importance of that communal autonomy that exists. Um, on the question of equality and decolonization, I guess I, I feel like Lana keeps offering them up as, as opposites or alternatives. Um, and that's what's troubling to me. It seems to me that um, uh, I never suggested in my essay that civil rights, the, writing, the right to vote was it, in itself enough. In fact, I said explicitly in my essay that I thought that one of the, that in a one state, uh, Israel-Palestine with formal equality, Israel-Palestine would grapple with many of the same problems of enormous economic inequity that plague the United States and South Africa and many other societies. And I don't, as someone who, you know, and I, I nor did I suggest in my essay that, um, that, South Afri that where South Africa is now is enough. I think South Africa, you know, South Africa has not done very much land reform. And that's part of it's not only part of the, the, the kind of economic and moral problem that apartheid post apartheid South Africa faces, it's also actually a major political problem. It's going gonna, it's gonna to threaten, I think, the, polit the political stability of, the, of South Africa as a liberal democracy. It's not surprising that countries like South Korea that actually did do a lot of land reform, I think, were ultimately have been, that was critical to their, their ability to become kind of more mature liberal democracies. But I don't see these things as opposites. I don't think, I think that, um, you know, uh, 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 it you it's important to acknowledge it seems to me how crucial individual rights the right to vote um, are and and also to recognize that decolonization which comes without those things or something that calls itself decolonization but ends up not respecting basic basic political and civil rights is also not a model that we want um, and um, so I, I think that uh, I guess I would say you know I think it's interesting that Lana, Kind of obliquely acknowledged, if I understood her correctly, at the beginning, that actually many of the leaders of the many of the political leaders of Palestinian citizens of of Israel themselves speak in a liberal political language. Um, and so, you know, it's always important to remember here that no community is monolithic. And I don't think that um, uh, that the leaders of the joint list are dismissive of the notion of, 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 of political rights, of civil rights, of equality. They may well believe that those don't go far enough, and I would agree with them. But I think in, rec in saying that they don't go far enough, we also need to recognize that they are, they are a precondition. You would not be able to get to uh, even a conversation about genuine land reform in South Africa unless Blacks had first won the right to vote. Shoal, do you want to respond to any of that back and forth? Um, yeah, interesting. I, I, I think that um, the decolonization idea is, I think, an important piece of the conversation. I, I would say it this way, though, and this is why I'm, I'm, I'm kind of making this claim, which I know seems somewhat um, provocative about uh, the left um, advocating for annexation. I think I think we're talking about a long durée here, and and we have to know we have to decide where to begin, and I think the place to begin is, and this is where Peter is so useful. Uh, the place to begin is to finally take two states off the table, because I think two states is preventing the conversation, and then there's a long process of thinking about the, the, the uh, reforming the very apparatus and structures and institutions of the state from the 1953 Land Acquisitions Act, where all land that wasn't inhabited at or by a certain date became state land and all of those kinds of things. So basically, if you annex the West Bank, you have a population that is largely 50% 50, 50 Jewish and 50% 
um, Muslim and Christian Palestinian. And then, you be, then, then the fight really begins and it's not gonna be a pleasant one, but at least you can begin the process. So I don't know if, um, if either Peter or I are really opposing what Lana is saying as much as saying, this is a process that is going to take generations and, and, and we have to begin somewhere. Right, and the somewhere to begin is to recognize, as Peter is asking us to do, that between the river and the sea, there is one country, and that one country is called Israel. And that one country has a population which is largely 50% Jewish and 50% Muslim and Christian Palestinian. What kind of country is that going to be? How are those citizens going to be treated? What are gonna be the structures and the institutions of that country vis-a-vis -vis representation? Will there be a slow diminishing or diminution of Jewish exceptionalism, which is to my mind, the backbone of the inequality? And if you wanna call it decolonization, fine. I mean, I have no problem with that term, um, but I just feel like we have to kind of begin the process to go along. I, I also wanna say something that we haven't really addressed yet, but I, I know that people, a lot of people talk about this notion of the status quo. And I think Peter didn't talk about it in his essay. I, I, I mentioned something in my, in my review of, 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 Ian Lustig, of Ian Lustig's book. The status quo is a myth. There is no status quo. There's settlement construction every day, right? A status quo would be the immediate cessation of all settlement construction and to reach a stasis whereby things are not changing. That's kind of what the status quo is. So when people talk about the status quo, that's just a veil for the continued, continued set of colonialist project. And as long as people will say, we need to have the status quo for now, all that means is it's making, it's making the reality either of decolonization or annexation or the ending the occupation or whatever you want to talk about, it, it, it pushes it off so that it can never exist. So I think in a way, as I said at the outset, the importance of Peter's piece is in a sense, putting the two staters on the defensive. And I think that is what is so, um, uh, that is what has caused so much anxiety because the two staters were never on the defensive. They were always, yeah, we're the two staters. We want the right thing. This is the moral position. And Peter is saying, no, first of all, it's not necessarily the moral position. And second of all, it really isn't a possibility anymore. Okay, um, there's a lot here. Um, I'm mindful of time, but I wanted to bring in one thing that I've seen a little bit in the chat and that I know were also um, critiques that we've heard coming up in this conversation. Um, a lot of critics of the one state argument say, well, it's unrealistic given, we're obviously here all talking about engaging with the one state reality. Another thing that folks have often brought up and some of you have already referenced this is that it's not yet necessarily a majority view of Israelis or Palestinians who live in the region. So um, I'm not sure to start with here. Um, uh, maybe Lana, I will go back to you, but I would just love to ask you um, what you make of that critique and also what you think the role of diaspora voices, Jewish and Palestinian are in this conversation. Thank you. So <clears throat> I wanna make clear, I'm not saying that decolonization and equality are opposites. What I'm saying is that equality goes through decolonization. And if we don't talk about equality in relation to colonization and decolonization, then we get what we get is only we can get only in so far politically. Um, the talking about one state and talking about equality without talking about Zionism is a political choice, right? And it reflects a particular political project, which I disagree with. Because essentially, if we are going to be talking about decolonization, and this is not a matter of semantics, and it reminds me of the piece of um, 
of uh, even Tucker. Decolonization is not a metaphor. I'm not throwing decolonization as this buzzword that sounds radical. Decolonization is about acknowledging histories of colonization. It is about acknowledging how the Palestinian struggle for freedom, not necessarily for statehood, by the way, in terms of the language, has been formulated by early leaders and intellectuals of the Palestinian liberation movement, movement and how it was formulated in the 60s and the 70s. It's going back to these legacies, and these legacies are part of my political uh, my political project and my political history and my political present as well. I think if there was something that was destructive for the Palestinian um, for the Palestinian project was actually those decades where we adopted that framework of liberal peace, where we went for the two state solution, when we went for the Oslo Accord, when, the, when we adopted liberal frameworks, and where I see something positive that is currently happening is this kind of return to thinking about the question of Palestine in the colonial terms. So there is a long history, and I saw the comment that Mesna thought to uh, put on the, we need to remember that the Palestinian struggle was integral part struggle of the anti, you know, of the third world liberation movement. And that history, this is a place where, as she mentioned, we were legible in. And that is history that is relevant to our struggle today and to, way, to, to the ways in which we think about um, the question of Palestine and how do we want to move forward with it? So no, decolonization is not just a word. It's not a metaphor. It's not semantics. It is fundamental. It is foundational. It has a political significant history and present to it. Uh, but I haven't answered the question on diaspora. I think, um, so I, I, you know, I have an issue with looking at uh, the, you know, Jewish jury as diaspora. I think we need to be clear. Um, the Palestinians who are outside of Palestine are refugees, are exiled communities, that history is fresh. It is not a faraway history. We all have grandparents who lived in Akbe. We all have, we all are still living in Akbe and its consequences and its ongoing operate, its ongoing working on the ground. Um, so we don't occupy, the, it's not a Palestinian uh, diaspora and a Jewish diaspora. We are a refugee and exiled. Uh, most of our people are refugees and exiled population. It's not just about um, a manufactured political project that created that link. So we can talk about the relationship that, you know, uh, that Jews around the world may feel to Israel. And I can understand the relationship people may feel to the places and to the Jewish history in Palestine. Between that and between a political project of return, there is a long way. And I think also, I don't, I want to live in a place that gives uh, people a place of refuge, but let us not forget that maybe Jews left as refugees, they, not maybe, they left as refugees, they left Europe as refugees, but they arrived to the shores of Palestine as colonialists. And this is something I think we need to reckon with, but there is no equivalence between what is called the Jewish diaspora and the Palestinian diaspora. I mean, the experiences and the place and the positionality are completely different. Um, Shaul and then Peter, I'd love you guys to jump in and I just okay. want to know, we'll go about like 10 minutes over or so. And okay. Um, then it's very interesting. In 1974, a young group, a group of young Jews uh, organized around the, uh, the name of Breira, which was the first American Jewish group that was advocating for two states. And they were summarily shut down by the uh, American Jewish community by 1976 they were gone and basically the, the argument was two states is a utopian vision so now 
In 2020, Peter comes out with an essay in Jewish Currents advocating for one state. And what do the Jews say? Ah, one state is a utopian vision. In a certain sense, it, 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 I think that the, 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 the problem is letting go of the, realist, the realistic reality, the realistic possibility of two states. Is one state, is a one state vision, first of all, there already is just one state. It's just not a democratic state. But is, is, a, one, is a one true democratic state a utopian vision? I don't think it's any more utopian than two states. So I think the, equal, the, the playing field is equal. On the diaspora question, very interesting, um, Nahum Goldman, who was the president of the American Jewish Congress in the 1950s, went with a group of American Jews to, to Israel in 1955, 56, to do a study of the lives of Arabs living in Israel, in the Arab Triangle, in the north part of the country. They came up with a very critical, very damning report. And it was Nachman Goldman's job to go to Ben-Gurion, to David Ben-Gurion, to report on, to, to give the report. And he was very nervous. And he began by saying, Prime Minister, I know I'm an American Jew. I, live in, I, I don't live in Israel. I, I'm, I don't know if I can really, how I feel about giving you this report, which is very critical of the, the lives of Arabs in Israel. And Ben-Gurion said something very interesting, also problematic. He said, you're a Jew. You have the right to criticize Israel wherever you live. Now, that also, I mean, the problem with that is a non-Jew should have the right to criticize Israel also. But the very idea that's become so much um, the kind of lingua franca of this, this whole debate is that if you're a diaspora Jew and you don't live in Israel and you're not paying the price, you have no right to weigh in. I think it was a false idea and I think Ben-Gurion understood that. You can't make the argument that Israel is the homeland of the Jewish people and then say that those that are not living in that homeland should not be able to criticize what's going on there. So I would say that the idea of diaspora Jews criticizing Israel, first of all, for most diaspora Jews, Israel isn't really about the country in the Mediterranean anyway. It's really about their own Jewish identity, right? Which is a separate problem in terms of the Zionization of American Jewry. That, that's, that's for another conversation. But I, I think that the fact that no, the fact that Israelis could say, we don't care what Peter Beinar or Ian Lustig or Shaul Magid, whoever, we don't care what they say, that's fine with me. I don't care that they don't care. In, in a sense, what matters is, is that Israel is something that matters to us who are diaspora Jews. And as a result of it mattering to us, we're gonna be able, we're gonna weigh in in the way we want to weigh in. They don't have to pay attention to us. And that's why I said, Peter's article is really two pronged. On the one hand, what kind of state is Israel gonna be? And on the other hand, what is Zionism in America? Um, and all of the pushback that happens with If Not Now and all these other groups, that's the nature of what's happening. The idea of distancing from Israel and all of that sociological studies that have been going on with that. The reality is, is that's what may happen. There may be a breach. And if there is, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Peter, you want to jump in? Sure. I guess I would say, um, I mean, I, I take Lana's point that um, the, the position of Palestinian refugees and exiles and the position of the Jewish diaspora is fundamentally different. Um, um, uh, I, I also think that um, the challenge of a movement for for freedom, which will be, I think, naturally a Palestinian-led, although not only a Palestinian movement, is to both impose pressure um, and also to try to offer a moral vision um, uh, in which uh, Jews feel included. And I, I, I think that, um, that mor for, for Jews to feel included in that moral vision, I think that moral vision has to acknowledge um, the depth of the Jewish felt connection historically uh, uh, to, um, to Israel-Palestine. Um, and so while I, I, I'm not, I don't exactly know what, um, we would have to take another conversation to quite entirely under, unpack what Lana meant by manufactured, um, but um, I don't think that um, most Jews, I don't think feel that our connection uh, to that land is manufactured. 
Um, um, uh, uh, and and uh, although even even as we can recognize it, we should recognize that it is 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 utterly different in many ways from the Palestinian connection. Um, um, the um, the I guess that just to go to your earlier point about about the kind of Palestinian leadership. I mean, I think one of the one of the challenging parts of this conversation is that um, you know it makes it so utterly different than let's say South Africa in the 1980s. Let's say. Um, is that um, while there is this a powerful a Palestinian acad, acad, you know, intellectual and activist voice um, talking about equal, you know, of, of, about decolonization and, and one equal state, there is still a political, a Palestinian political leadership that represents the PLO that's talking about two states. And not only that, but even the Palestinian leadership inside Israel is talking about two states. Now, what it means by two states is not the same thing. I think as what you know, um, most Jews mean by two states, because it's a two states which presumably includes the right of return and 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 means uh, and means equality inside the Green Line. But there is still, it, it seems to me, it's an odd kind of moment we're in, where the, there is this uh, there's this dichotomy between between the Palestinian political leadership and the kind of the most I think in, influential Palestinian intellectual and activist voices. And then you know, and then you throw in public opinion data. Now I don't really know. You know, it would probably take a whole other seminar to try to figure out what one should do with Palestinian public opinion data uh, and how one makes sense of that, right? But if one takes the it on its face again, which may be a, a mistake. Again, in most of the opinion Palestinian public opinion data is just um, East Jerusalem, West Bank, Gaza. It's not, you know, among Palestinians uh, outside of Israel Palestine. Um, you know, you see a split in terms of these things. So again, I think that's one of the things that, again, for those of us who are not Palestinian, isn't something we can engage in very easily. Um, but I do think it's something that makes the conversation complicated. And it's certainly one of the things that has been, you know, that I have, has been, you know, and responses to me has been kind of omnipresent. It's to say, essentially, what, Beinart, you're more Catholic than the Pope? You know, what, the, the PLO still supports two states. The public opinion data still shows a lot of, even I'm an ODA supports two states. So who the heck are you? You know? And so I think that again, for those of us who are not Palestinians is, is, um, is something that we can only, only, we can only watch. Lana, I want to give you like one minute to respond to some of those things that they just brought up if you want to, but I'm mindful of time. Be on a positive note. Mm. <laughs> um, I do think that there is something positive that is happening. And we are starting to talk, I mean, at least in the West, there is a conversation about, you know, the end of the, the, the death of the two state solution, though I just, I wonder how many times can we bury that, you know, that corpse already. Um, but it is a positive conversation that is happening. Um, and I think we need really to think hard about the political language that we can use and the political language we need to de develop moving forward. Um, and, and also not to forget uh, the many legacies that we do have on kind of a humanist vision for Israel, Palestine. And I am emphasizing here the Palestinian humanist legacy because Palestinians always insisted that it would be a home to both. Even at the height of, um, of the 60s and the 70s, um, there was an insistence on one space that can accommodate both. In what ways? It's disputable, but nonetheless, that was the political imperative. Um, and this is a legacy that we need to remember. And we need to remember that the Palestinian, Palestinians have always been inclusionary. Uh, the logic of, in, of exclusion, of segregation uh, was always Zionist, not Palestinian. And moving forward, this is something we really need to center in the conversation on, you know, a positive one state. 
Perfect. So on that note, I wanted to ask us in closing, I wanted to ask each of you if you uh, could give our audience uh, a reading recommendation. Peter started uh, mentioning a bunch of Palestinian authors he's been reading. We got lots of questions in the chat about who those people are. So I would just love to ask each of you to give like one or two uh, recommendations for our audience. I could start. Um, I would say um, Ian Lustig's book, Paradigm Lost. I think it's a fascinating study of not only um, the, the, the end of two states, but the argument that two states was never really a viable option in terms of the structures and the institutions and the political decisions that Israel made from 1967 on. The other book I would mention is Dmitry Shumsky's Beyond the Nation State, which Peter, I think, mentions in his piece as well, which is a fascinating study of some of the early Zionist thinkers from Herzl, Jabotinsky, and Ben-Gurion and others who were really actually very, very reluctant to, um, to vie for a state, a nation state, and thought that there were incredible problems in that. And the, set, and the final thing I would say is two essays by Hannah Arendt, one called Saving the Homeland, and the other one called um, Zionism Reconsidered, which, it, which are both collected in the Jewish writings of Hannah Arendt, which offer fabulous um, critiques and assessments of Zionism from the late 1940s and the early 1950s. So those would be mine. Peter? Um, I guess I, I mentioned three things. First, just because it's just what I was reading most recently. Uh, the Raja Shahada's kind of memoir, uh, Strangers in the House, which I just think is a kind of a beautiful, it, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a lot, it's, it's, it's just, it's a story of someone's life, but set against the backdrop of the dispossession of, of Palestinians. I think, you know, in a, uh, and just Raja Shahada is such a beautiful writer and such a kind of idiosyncratic and thoughtful person that I think it, 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 bring, it for me, at least it, it, it brought it out, brought out some of these historical themes very powerfully. Um, a second would be, um, uh, this edit, an edited volume um, on, on the Holocaust and the Nakba that came out recently by Amos Goldberg and Bashir Bashir, which right. I think is a series of kind of fascinating essays about the way these two historical episodes and kind of and then narratives kind of interplayed with one another. And the third is actually um, an essay that I recently came across, an interview that I recently came across with the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish. Um, in 1996 with an Israeli journalist named Khalid Yesharin. And I just thought that the, the, the conversation in that long, long interview between Darwish and an Israeli who is both, an Israeli Jew who's both sympathetic, but also at times um, uh, challenging uh, or in a different place than him is, uh, is just, uh, I thought it was, it was a really fascinating document um, in terms of understanding um, different perspectives on this. And I, I found some of the things that Darwish says in this interview, deeply, deeply morally compelling. Lana? Shell, do you want to add something? Can I just add two things? But I'll give you the last word. The, other, the two other things that I was thinking of is Saeed's The Question of Palestine, which I think, even though it was written a while ago, I, I think it resonates very much. And finally, Seth and Ziska's Preventing um, Palestine is also a fabulous read. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to get to read to it. Lana, go ahead. Yeah, so many um, wonderful Palestinian authors that one can read. Um, Sarin Makdisay Nur Arikat, Ali Abu Naima, Yusuf Munayir, and many others, uh, Joseph Masad. Um, Nadia Abul Haj and her fantastic critique of actually the book by Bashir Bashir, and I forgot the name of the second co editor. Uh, but given the conversation um, today about Zionism, I think a key text for those who want to be familiar with Palestinian authors is Edward Said's Zionism from the Standpoint of Its Victims. I think this is a an absolutely fundamental reading uh, to anyone that is considering a project of reforming Zionism. Um, I think this, this text for me makes it very clear uh, why from a Palestinian perspective there is 
um, anti-Zionism is, is, as Noor Arikat pointed um, in a tweet a few days ago, and I'm quoting, is tantamount to our existence. And anything else is asking us to sell and destruct. Um, and, and so, yeah, Edward Said, Zionism from the standpoint of its victims. Thank you all for that. And um, just to wrap up, I just want to note for our audience that, first of all, this conversation is being recorded. It is on YouTube. So feel free to uh, revisit it and specifically also to hear the reading racks. And, uh, and uh, I think you might also get some of those reading racks in an email from Jewish Currents tomorrow if you're on the Jewish Currents email list. So you should sign up for it. Uh, and with that, um, I just wanted to thank all of our panelists so much for being here. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I know I learned a lot. I have a lot more questions. I feel like we all just barely scratched the surface. And judging by our Q&A, um, I know there were a lot of questions that people want answers for. Um, but uh, to be continued, thank you all so much. And thank you, Shaul. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Lana. Thank you, Jewish Currents. Thank you, Foundation for Middle East Peace and Extend. And have a good night, everyone. And thank you, Simone, for being a great moderator. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> it was a great honor. <laughs>